Welcome to the Expanding Consciousness Podcast with your hosts, Michael Wally and Nicholas Hart. In this podcast, we explore ways to sharpen our awareness, make life more enjoyable, be a little kinder, become more authentic, less reactive, more present, and ultimately expand our consciousness. We're happy to have you along for the ride. And if you do enjoy these conversations, please leave a review or a comment as this goes a long way for us. Enough of the promotional talk and enjoy this episode. All right. Welcome to this week's podcast. The topic we picked out for today will be procrastination. A rather unpleasant topic, uh, if you ask me, (laughs) Um, because I definitely am guilty of procrastination often. Perhaps this is the reason why I ended up doing doing jobs where this kind of fits, for example, as a software developer, I think, you know, as a person who procrastinates or is, let's say, lazy, I think this is kind of a a job that you can still do because uh, your laziness pays off, kind of, you, you know, you come up with smarter solutions where you need to work less, you kind of automate stuff. So, so it's somewhat compatible. So doing that job, I was able to somehow avoid facing the fact that uh, I'm probably uh, a procrastinator. Um, but on the other hand, I also think it's a, it's a universal experience that everybody experiences phases of procrastination. And yeah, just recently, we can be open about it. I think like working on the, on the course that, that Michael and me are working on on the side, you know, which is kind of a creative uh, endeavor, which is really interesting and fun. Yet I had really moments where I was almost unable uh, to work on on this project and where I just observe myself going into patterns of distraction or finding excuses why right now would not be um, a great time to to work on it. And, you know, I got curious about that because I was really wondering, like, This is a task that I picked out for myself that I'd like to do. The topic is interesting. You know, it is, you know, at that very edge of, I do think I have the skill set for it, yet my skill set needs to to grow a little bit, you know, at that point where I could actually easily get into flow with the task, yet my subconscious was somehow sabotaging me and um, saying I should probably, I should rather watch YouTube shorts instead of task or, you know, whatever it is that I use for distraction. Um, so, so yeah, I got kind of curious about that and I would like to reflect a little bit on what is, what the hell is procrastination and, and why does it occur? So yeah, I want to ask you first, uh, in your opinion, on your experience, what's going on when we procrastinate? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely guilty of this a lot as, as well. And, and certainly like throughout school, usually my uh, modus operandi, I guess you could say, is I would procrastinate until I felt that there's not enough time left to to get done what I need to get done, and then I would do it. You know, and yeah, you know, I mean, it it worked out fairly well, but I and it, it's something that I still struggle with. But I think what's going on is there's some underlying fear, right? There's there's sort of a, a force or a, an internal pressure that's pushing against us that's making it you know easier to distract yourself than it is to go ahead and and do the work and i think a lot of it comes down to you know fear of potentially feel of fear of failure uh you know potentially fear of of being judged by what you produce often i think uh we tend to be our harshest critics right so you know there's this uh kind of strive striving for perfectionism i think kind of comes into it like it's never really good enough you know also i find myself starting a lot of projects and and never finishing them like i'll i'll, I'll start it and then you know i'll have more ideas about well the approach that i'm taking isn't good enough or i should have done this other thing and i'll just sort of like discourage myself from doing it cuz i feel that i'm not doing it well enough right 
And there's nobody, you know, the interesting part about that is there's nobody telling me that there's nobody actually judging anything that I'm producing and saying, oh, you did a, a, a terrible job, you know, and I can't even, you know, and uh, certainly in my adult life, I can't even really look back and say like, oh, there were times where I just, I just really flopped and, and I had a really hard time. People, you know, called me out on it. I can't say that there were times like that, you know, so I, I guess probably a lot of things happened in childhood i mean school is you know public school certainly very ripe for the for those types of opportunities uh to you know experience some embarrassment and and humiliation based off of what you did or or didn't do um you know so i i think you know if i were to kind of borrow a uh an idea from from joe hudson art of, art of accomplishment folks is it's it's really it's an avoidance of a certain feeling Right. And I, I think the way to work through it, uh, can't say that I've put a lot of effort into working through it myself. I've something I've procrastinated around, right? Like procrastinated, uh, trying to work on my procrastination. Right. And I think the thing to do is, is to like, look at it and say like, okay, if, if I do do this and I put that out there and I fail and, and people just tell me that what I created was, was absolute garbage. What do I have to feel at that point? And am I okay feeling that? Right, like exploring those feelings, and then once I've kind of, in a sense, acclimated to those feelings, such that they're no longer something that I fear experiencing, then maybe some of that procrastination starts to to start to fade away and doesn't affect me as much. It's uh, it's an idea, right? Not something that I've necessarily implemented very uh, very well around procrastination. At least, mm -hmm. procrastination seems to be the thing that keeps our dreams at bay. So in general, fulfilling your dreams and, and working on creative, uh, creative endeavors or being an, an artist is not something that our society uh, is made for or that is kind of encouraged, at least in the school system I went through, you know, I was encouraged to become this productive uh, member of, of, of a company and, you know, work nine to five, uh, seek out security, uh, seek to follow the masses and um and not stand out oh so even as a society you know we we don't encourage people to really do that um yeah so procrastination is, is this hurdle in between us and and let's say living or achieving our dreams that's that's how it seems to work for me so for example i have this Uh, idea in mind that uh, uh, this is this project that I would really like to do. I don't know, this whatever software project that I'd like to launch or this anything creative uh, I, I would like to do. And while I have this idea, I really romanticize it. You know, it's it's really great. It lives in, in my head as uh, with all of this potential. I think, wow, this could be so great if I, if I do this, you know, it could have all of these implications. It could lead me to, to all of these things. But if I really step into action and, and do it, you know, all of these hopes become questionable because it, it might also yeah. be that, you know, this, this is only as romantic in your head. And when you actually do it, um, it's not going to be that great or at worst, you, you're going to fail with it. And um, I think we have this tendency to, we don't want to burn ourselves out Uh, in attempts towards our dreams. It sounds very vague, but what mm. I mean is, um, I think if I, uh, if I'd start three times to do a creative project and I fail all three times, I think the fourth time would be really difficult, mm. but which is, um, which is kind of stupid because that's actually how people get successful, right? They just try many times yeah. and failing is, is part of the process, but We're, we're so not resilient towards failure that at the slightest fail, we, we already stop. We, we drop the project. We, uh, we try, we try to find anything to distract ourselves, to not act on these dreams, to not run into these precisely negative feelings. But the problem is that if we, um, if we don't keep going, at it and keep trying these things to fulfill our dreams, then the alternative is really bad because the alternative will be a life of resentment. 
if we, you know, completely yeah. drop those ambitions and dreams that we have, and we just always choose the, um, the safe and working option, we end up in a life that is safe and predictable, but not what we actually desire. So that's why I think it's, it's probably important that we do face this question of procrastination and think about how can we yeah. overcome this hurdle so that we um, become more fluent in, in working also with rejection, with failure, and that we keep going even though if we fail a couple of times because uh, this is what, it, what it's going to take. Um, so maybe let, let's think about that. How can we... Um, so we recognize procrastination as a pattern of self-sabotage that wants to um, prevent us from experiencing negative emotions around failure, feeling like a failure. Mm -hmm. Yet we understand that it's necessary. So how can we sort of undo this pattern? Yeah, definitely the the crux of of everything that we're talking about. Um, I I suppose mm -hmm. it it can be helpful to to see where it came from, and and you know if we look at the way that we were raised and and public school in general, I mean failing at anything is definitely looked down upon, right? I mean, you get graded, right? And to, to get a failing grade is like, well, you messed up. It's not like, it's not okay to get a failing grade, at least, you know, in, in the culture and the, the family that I, I grew up in, you know, and my, my older sister who was, uh, you know, high, high achiever and always, always doing well, getting good grades. There was sort of this sense of like, well, it's, it's not okay to not do well. It's not okay to fail. And I think that that, uh, you know, as, as we're talking through it, that's something that really needs to be addressed. And how do you address it now that we're adults and that we've learned this habit, we've learned this belief that it's not okay to fail. How do we uh, allow, how do we change it? Right. And, and I, I mean, I think the obvious answer is, well, you have to be able to, you know, fail and, and, and accept it, right. And, and learn from it. And, you know, I, I think rationally speaking, there's plenty of good examples and there's plenty of, you know, there's, there's a whole crowd of like, uh, you know, entrepreneurs that are like, yeah, I've, I've failed a bunch of times. And the only reason I was able to be successful is because I learned so much from those failures. And, and so maybe part of it is, is a bit of a mindset shift in terms of reframing what a failure is and maybe you know, maybe even get a little rigid around it and say like, okay, before I succeed at this, I know that I have to fail five times or, or something, right? Give yourself some arbitrary goal. I am going, maybe the goal is even failure, right? Maybe even I'm approaching this thinking that I am going to fail and I'm totally okay with that. And my goal is, I mean, I'm not going to self-sabotage in the sense, mm -hmm. um, but I am going to tell myself like, I'm going to do this and I think that the outcome is going to be failure and I want that outcome because I know that it will give me an opportunity to shift my relationship to failure but it'd also be a, a you know a significant learning experience as well so maybe that's that's one tactic I mean it's in a sense it's kind of playing a game with yourself and as with everything that we talk about there are so many levels that we can work uh work on this at and so I guess right now we're kind of talking about the, working at it with the mental level. You know, there's also potentially, uh, we alluded to working with it on the emotional level in terms of, hey, there are some emotions we don't want to feel. So try, try to feel into those and see if you can kind of acclimate and, and uh, you know, uh, reduce some of the resistance towards that. Then there's also potentially, I, su I suppose, the, the body level, like, okay, when... Uh, when you're in this procrastination mode, what's actually going on in your body? You know, I, I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's an important question, something to examine. Mm -hmm. On an emotional level, I think one aspect of procrastination might also be the fear of, so we talked about the failure, but there's also one step before where it's perhaps just overwhelm of a difficult problem. So usually we dread tasks that are in particularly difficult because we, 
because they are so either complex or difficult, we don't want to face them directly because we think that we're going to experience some kind of overwhelm, either like mental or, or emotional nature. So if I have a really difficult task, you know, I don't want to face it. I, I guess what helps, or at least what helps me personally sometimes is if, if I'm already at the step where I recognize, okay, I'm, I'm kind of trying to avoid this task is to break the task down. So to not, you know, maybe you cannot do, you cannot achieve the, the difficult problem at hand, but maybe you can break it down. Maybe you can take one step towards it. And that usually mm -hmm. clears out, um, a, a lot of, um, a lot of the feelings uh, around it and, and makes it easier because then, you know, you took at least one step towards it and the task became smaller and you perhaps you gained some clarity on the task. Perhaps you found out that, you know, the, the complexity is not that great as you anticipated. So breaking difficult tasks down into smaller, more digestible problems can sometimes eradicate the complete problem of procrastination around it. Um, but for me personally, it can at least unblock me for the moment. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's a, a really good tactic overall. I mean, uh, we're both programmers, and so this is something that we potentially encounter. I mean, I know having started at, at, at a new company that is rather large and has a rather large and complex code base, I'll often be tasked with something that when I'm tasked with it, I don't know how to do it. Right. And that not knowing how to do it is often a bigger hurdle than actually doing it. Right. And it's, it's not so much, it's almost like it's a mental game again. It's sort of a lack of confidence. I'm, I can get things done very, very quickly when I know the solution, when the solution, you know, as soon as you give me the problem, I, I know the solution. I know that part of the code base, you know, I can, I can even picture, you know, getting it all done and, and, you know, what, what I need to do and what steps I need to take. But when it's something that I'm not familiar enough with and that I actually have to learn more and able to accomplish the, the task, I think that that tends to be a lot more challenging, just especially as we age, right? Cause when we're children, you're in that position kind of constantly, you know, through school or, or whatever it might be that you're, you're learning or, um, you know, developing that you don't know. You don't have the confidence that you know how to do this. You don't, I mean, you've never even done it. You've never even tried it. It's something totally novel and fresh. And uh, at some point, I guess we kind of get a little bit complacent and, and we only try to tackle the things that we know how to do because that's, that's comfortable and that's easy, you know, and we kind of, uh, you know, I, we kind of, in a sense, keep dancing around this idea of, of growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And personally, when I reflect upon, you know, my own disposition and, and what sort of mindset I have, I would say that I very much so grew up or grew into like a fixed mindset of like, um, for me, it was sort of, well, I'm, I'm a smart person and I can do this or something. And it wasn't ever like, I'm going to be able to do this even if I fail, if I'm persistent, I, I never really learned that you know, I need to persist and I need to, to grow, you know, up to being able to do this task. It was always like, you're smart enough and you're just, you're just going to do it and you're just going to breeze through it. And most of school was like that for me until I got to college and I was, you know, taking more, more challenging, you know, math and science classes where I actually had to, to work and I did not do a very good job because it didn't just come easily. Right. It, it required, you know, more, more learning than, you know, it required more of a growth mindset than what I really had. And I, you know, reaching a point in my life where I want to, you know, start a business or, you know, be able to move beyond what I currently do in, in my career. I find that this is really one of the biggest hurdles is that I don't feel that I have much of a growth mindset. I don't have the mindset of, well, I can't do it right now with the resources I have, but tomorrow or the next day, and after I've developed those resources, then I have confidence that I can develop that and do that. I feel that I'm lacking that a lot personally. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it has a lot to do with uncertainty and uncertainty being experienced mm -hmm. as a discomfort, right? I mean, as soon yeah. as we exper experience uncertainty, we are outside of our comfort zone and this is not 
where where we want to be, and we we are not really resilient um, towards uncertainty yet. This is one of the best skills you could have because it's it's applicable to basically any field. But I, I gotta say that, I mean, you you talk that about yourself that you don't have the skill yet. You um, you do a job which requires that every day. I mean, if we think about programming, yeah. it's it's like problem solving. So every day you're thrown, they uh, they throw different problems at you, and you experience that uncertainty of I don't know yet at all how to fix this bug or how to implement this feature, like literally on a daily basis. So on a, on a micro level, yeah. you are very trained with it. Yet when you think about larger problems. You you have the feeling that you're you're not doing so well with it, so I would actually question that. I, I do think that you mm -hmm. you already have the skill. You you only need to have the courage to apply it also to to other fields. And yeah, yeah this is what we're conditioned not to do. We're conditioned to stay within our lane and to mm -hmm. stay within our comfort zone and to just just stay where we are because it feels safe. It feels familiar but what we should do instead if we follow our desires and our dreams is are we able to lean into uncertainty even yeah. what how we described it before even knowing that we will fail at one point but can we be okay also with failing can we be okay with being rejected and I think the deciding factor is what is our motivation, you know, to do so. Because failing is, I guess, very bad or will feel terrible. But if you have a good why, you know, it's all worth it. I mean, in the same way, mm -hmm. like you would suffer and fail for somebody close to you, you know, you would do anything for some people close to you because you have a good why, right? Because it's it, it's for them. Yeah. So the question is, what is it worth failing for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really important question. I think that's really valuable and, uh, and interesting to explore. I probably mentioned it in the last podcast, but I just listened to this book called Start With Why, which is precisely about like, you know, creating great company culture, uh, you know, getting employees engaged you know, work, you know, find, finding the motivation within your own life. And it, it really is about finding, you know, what, a, having a reason for, for why you're doing it. And for, for me, when I kind of look at my why right now, why do I get up in the morning and go to work? A lot of it comes from fear because I'm, I'm afraid of not having enough money. I'm afraid of, you know, being homeless. I'm afraid of, you know, uh, and very little of it comes down to like, oh, well, I, I feel good or it aligns with my values or, you know, so the company I, I work at, one of our values is like connecting people, right. in community. And that's something that I personally, uh, value. And I, and I see that there's uh, a lot of uh, the, in, in a sense, it's lacking and it's something that we're all looking for, you know? But then there's there's like this disconnect in terms of the actual work that I do and trying to connect it to that why. And I also don't necessarily feel that I'm um, very in touch with that why, right? Like I, I'm, it's not integrated into my life. I'm not living that way. I'm not going out of my way to make new connections with people. I'm not going out of my way to participate in communities in such a way that, you know, feels rewarding there there was a little bit of a time where i was engaging with that a lot more and i was pushing myself outside my comfort zone and it you know oftentimes my mind would come up with a, a million excuses for why i shouldn't do it but then i'd just eventually do it anyways and it would end up being like i you know i was really glad that i that i pushed myself and, and that i did that um that's fallen by the wayside a little bit especially since i've you know kind of gotten back into my career and so for, for me right now, the journey is like, okay, how do I reintegrate that into my life? How do I, you know, start to motivate myself? And it's not necessarily about changing things externally. You know, I 
believe that it's possible for me to find motivation and and enjoy what I do right now. Uh, I would say that currently I, I don't feel motivated and I don't necessarily enjoy it. Hope my uh, manager doesn't listen to this one. <laughs> but in, in any case, um, I think that you know it's. I, I think that we can. And I don't think that we necessarily need to change. I think that that's a trap in a, in a sense to say that you need to change your external first. I, I, I think it's almost important to change your, your mindset and to change your, your internal, you know, to work on it from that angle. It doesn't mean that the external won't change in that process, but I've been down the path before of trying to change the external in order to fix the internal and it doesn't work. What you're describing sounds a lot to the perspective that Michael Singer has often. Um, I think he did it this, the same way for himself, where he didn't change his externals, but you know he, he kept working the job he worked at, and, and he tried to somehow integrate surrender into that, and I think it worked out great for him. Uh, yeah. Right, they, they sold the, the company for, yeah. uh, it was like a multi-million dollar deal, and they were really successful, and for him, it worked out really this way and yeah definitely that's also something uh, i always try i try to make um, the life that i have right now worth living i try to somehow you know see the opportunity of growth uh, in that life and, and interestingly enough it is always there right i mean life challenges you always to grow yeah. whatever you do I, i think it's it's almost unavoidable so no doubt you can grow anywhere If uh, if growth is is what you're seeking, um, but yeah, there's still this problem that uh, it is somehow, or, or if we do a regular quote unquote job, it is somehow void of meaning. And I'm a proponent of finding your own purpose and you know somehow applying that. So, fr from my perspective, I think we should uh, all as people. Or if we if we choose to, you know, first of all, find our own whys, find our values, and then yeah. think about okay, how can we apply this somehow in the world? How can we somehow live our values and get into a position of contributing in the world to society? That will be the ultimate goal, where we don't only take care of ourselves and our personal growth, but where we are somehow. Um, utilizing our own talents in a way that uh, is contributing to the to the greater good uh, of society which is very ambitious uh, obviously especially since since doing so kind of collides with the system we have in place because the system we have in place rewards um, profit and is geared towards that all, all of the setup that the companies operate in is you know not altruistic but it's um, profit-oriented, and that's how everything works. That's how school works, that's how the university, universities work. They prepare you for the workforce. That's how the workforce itself works. That's how hierarchies within the workforce work. And if you follow that mindset, you can thrive in there. But it collides completely with this idea of how can I bring my talents to uh, make a contribution to society? And I think... There are some exceptions. So there's um, altruistic uh, companies like NGOs. There's also some companies that try to mix profit orientation with, with this idea, right? There's, I think, for example, the organization behind MAPS is somewhat profit oriented, yet they're following this, this cause. And there's a couple of companies which are trying to combine this. But all in all, I see it's, it's kind of this tension between these two forces. And trying to make it work will be always difficult. So I guess my point being is that I'm, I'm still trying to figure out a way. How can we do what we like to do um, and still live in this society, earn the money that we need to earn to you know, make the living that we need to, to pay the rent and, and everything and still follow our dreams and not only... Uh, pay up to to the profits of some company yeah yeah you know one of the things that came to mind i mean uh, 
I keep referencing that we're both programmers. And so, I, I mean, I don't know about you, Nick, but uh, in most of the companies that I've worked for, we heavily focus on analytics, right? Like we're measuring all the different ways that the apps are being used and we're measuring, you know, every new feature that we put out, we're, we're measuring how it's, how it's impacting our, our metrics. And, you know, a applying this uh, I idea to our own lives, I would say that in a sense, we're optimizing on the wrong metrics, right? Like we're optimized. So for example, we're optimizing on uh, profit. We're optimizing on, on all of these things that have kind of been uh, in, in almost, I'd say, imposed on us culturally, all the things that we're supposed to be optimizing on, right? Like uh, the the American dream, and how big of a car, how big of a house, or, you know, how, how nice of a car, I guess I should say, not necessarily big. Um, and it it doesn't ultimately yield the results that we want, right? I, I, I think in a sense, we should re-examine that like i mean I, at my company it's it's pretty heavily metric driven especially around like even individual performance and it you know i i think uh you know bar borrowing from the the book start with why that's all manipulation that's that's not something that's really going to motivate people there are people who can thrive in that and and i would say that you know, myself, at least I'm capable of forcing myself to thrive in that. But when I've done that in the past, you know, it leads to burnout because you're not, you're not in alignment, right. With, with your internal self, you're not in alignment with, with what's going on within you. You're not really, res in a sense, you're not really respecting yourself, you know? So my, my question, or, you know, maybe something to ponder is like, well, what, what are metrics that we can be optimizing on? You know, and of course, the first thing that comes to mind is like happiness. Of course, these aren't necessarily easy things to measure. It's easy to measure engagement and, and clicks and, you know, how long somebody spends on a certain page in your app or something. But it's very difficult to measure if that improves that person's happiness or not. Right. And, and so maybe one thing that we need is, is a clearer, maybe even objective ways, you know, and something that we're, we're interested in just in general is how the nervous system affects you know, everything that we experience and are there uh, what you could say maybe proxies that we could measure within the our physiology that could give you a good indicator you know actually it's it's and i'll, I'll just share this for what what the heck but i was kind of brainstorming a little bit the other day because I'm, I'm very interested in you know how we can utilize ai in in so many different ways i mean it's just just endless what what we can potentially do with it and one thing that I've, I've toyed with a lot over the years is teaching people to breathe better. So I was thinking of, you know, can I create some, uh, you know, system of devices that are like measuring a number of different uh, physiological markers, such as say like galvanic spin, skin response, which is measuring, you know, your level of anxiety, uh, you know, measuring your heart rate and changes in your heart rate and other things like that. And then, um, training an AI in such a way to, to optimize on the way that someone breathes in order to affect these physiological markers towards an optimal outcome. Right. And some, I mean, whether or not we really need technology to do this, I, I would say from the meditative perspective, Hey, we are capable of, you know, perceiving these things within ourself. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, going on, I'll stop there. Yeah. You know, and, and throw it back to you. I mean, well, what is interesting about that is that, so there, there's another factor. So, uh, when we think about what we should do that, that would be fulfilling and, or, or how we could contribute back to society. Like I mentioned before, you know, that it would be cool if we can fi find a thing that we're talented at, that we're good at, where we can contribute something back. But there's another factor, um, which comes up when you describe this example and it's, what is it that we can already do, right? So actually what you describe makes complete sense. Yeah. You have a history of, of software development and you already have the skill set. And instead of like completely abandoning that now to pursue something different, it would make complete sense that you try to actually innovate, um, perhaps in another field we're interested in, let it be health, let it be psychology, let it be spirituality and apply the knowledge that you already have as a software developer, because 
you know, on one hand, it would also kind of be a waste if you would now switch careers completely and, and you'd have nothing to do with technology anymore because you're trained for years in it and you have some some skills in there. So I, I think this is exactly the, the right direction of or the right line of thinking of, okay, what is it that I can bring to the table, right? What is it that I can innovate on with the skill set uh, that I have? And I mean, intersection of technology and spirituality is super interesting for me anyways. Like, I do always run into the same question that you that you brought up of like, do we actually need technology to to be more connected spiritually? Sure. And yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we don't need, but it helps. I mean, you know, do we need shoes yeah. for running? No, but you know, it helps. In the same way, it can work right. with technology. I mean, if we if we find a, a really cool biofeedback loop that you know gets us deeper into meditation, if if we find out that binaural beats. Uh, I don't know, over bone conduction, headphones or whatever are more effective, you know, why sure. not? Let's utilize all of this um, and let's try to in innovate with these things. So I'm completely uh, on your side. And this is also kind of the, uh, the direction I'm, I'm often thinking of like, okay, how can I apply the skill set that I, um, that I already have to, to the problems at hand? And I think we should do uh, uh, more of that and we should, um, it's kind of a so good indicator of where we could be successful would probably be um, what sparks our interest the most, what sparks our, our desire, what is the yeah. thing that that yeah. puts us into into flow state? Because I think that is that is a good predictor of where we could be successful at. Because when I look at all the people. I follow and I find their work interesting. I see this spark in them, right? So all of the content creators, all of the authors I, I, that are read their books, they seem to be exactly at that state of flow where uh, the production um, happens naturally, effortlessly, where they're, it seems to me, almost uh, channeling these things. And I don't know, maybe maybe for these people it's really difficult to write the books that they've wrote. But at least for me consuming, it seems, you know, effortless what, what I'm consuming from from those people. So I guess that that would be a good indicator or that would be the good direction to look at, okay, what is it that puts me into the flow state uh, that gives me that curiosity to spend hours on where time flies by, and, you know, uh, without you noticing and seek out more of those experiences. And unfortunately, yeah. oftentimes it's not tasks at work, which um, which makes me think that in the long run we we will probably need to break out of it and you know shift what we are doing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, but I also really like this idea of of kind of integrating your existing skill set with with what you find yourself to be passionate about. I. You know, what, what comes to mind is uh, at the end of one of my college courses, I think it was computer science algorithms course, the teacher shared with us who was his inspiration. And interestingly, he said that it was his son, you know, and it, it wasn't like just being uh, bragging or anything, but his, his son had combined essentially neuroscience and computer science. And this was, you know, this was probably you know, 14 plus years ago, 15 years ago. Right. And, and it, it didn't at, at the time, you know, of course it was, it was interesting and I was like, okay, well, yeah, he could, he could probably start getting into AI, but, but now as, as that landscape has, has changed a lot, you know, I think that, you know, it was almost like prescient. It was almost like very, um, you know, really ahead of the curve in, in a sense. Right. Cause now that, that combination is very valuable. Right. And, um, and like you were saying, utilizing technology to accelerate, to, to catalyze, um, getting into meditation and things like that and making it also making it so much more accessible, right? Because when you talk about something like meditation or breath work, it requires a decent amount of motivation and, and, uh, discipline to take it to the point where it becomes useful. 
right? And I think that that's a really big hurdle for a lot of people. And I think that that hurdle can be drastically reduced through technology. I mean, I've, I've uh, played around with a number of devices, for example, like the, the Muse headband, I have that for, for meditation or whatever. And it, uh, you know, I mean, I think for some people it, it could be motivating and something like that could, could work. But it's the technology around that isn't quite to the point where I, I feel that it's super useful, right? But I'm interested to see it evolve that way. And, and one of the things, you know, one of kind of the current catalysts, of course, uh, AI is going to be able to help us, uh, you know, tease out some of those patterns and, and be able to amplify, you know, um, amplify our, our, our ability to, to do things like meditate, you know, I think. And, so yeah, it's this question of of combining technologies potentially, um, you know, find, finding what you're passionate about. I, I think that 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 can be a real challenge, you know. And until maybe the last five or ten years, I don't know if I would have been able to answer that question very easily. Uh, but but today, I, I mean, I can tell you right away, it's it's exactly what we're doing right now. It, it's talking about these things and exploring the the psychological side of it but also the spiritual side and i mean i, I can talk about this stuff endlessly i, I probably and in, in plan to at some point write you know write a book or two um and, and so for me i suppose the challenge is really just in discovering okay i i know what i'm really passionate and interested about now how do i actually turn that into something this, this is where it gets really hairy how do i turn that into something where i make money yeah. you know that even just saying that does not feel good. Yeah, uh, I guess we sh maybe we sh shouldn't care so much about that, but we should care about how can you make the thing that you like somehow successful and make it connect with many people, because then per perhaps yeah. money will will follow eventually. Um, I guess, an anyways, if if you're doing something you're good at and you're proving your skill, money will follow um, eventually. But I agree, it's um, it's it's sort of a split that we need to do where you you know you want to do all of that you want to find something that matches your interests your ambitions and then also to to make a living out of it it's difficult but i don't think it's impossible um but one one hurdle i i often uh, still encounter there is whenever i have an uh, idea like that about any kind of i don't know innovation or a product that i i want to do i want to launch or whatever it's you know, we're, we're living, there's so many people in the world that whatever you think about, somebody had already thought about that. And most likely somebody already had thought about that before you and already started working on it. And that, that's, that's almost, um, that, that's kind of a, a bummer because it seems that there's, you almost cannot make an original thought anymore or you know, whenever I, I have this I, the feeling that, oh my God, this is a great idea. We should do something, you know, that does whatever on a technological level or on an innovation level. You Google for it and somebody somewhere already did that a couple mm -hmm. months mm -hmm. ago and, and released sure. it. It's, it's almost like you, you think of it and it already exists to this degree. Just because sure. we're so connected and it's so easy to build things nowadays that, you know, obviously if somebody has an idea, they can act on it. But th this was a reframe that needed to happen for me. Usually this, this was a bummer for me and what immediately made me drop the idea. But the fact that other people thought of it and did it doesn't, doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it because, you know, th yeah. there is enough space and there's enough market for multiple companies, multiple tools yeah. of doing the same thing. And this doesn't necessarily um, devalue it. And just because there's some competition in some field, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't go in that field. On the contrary, perhaps the fact that if you had an idea and it already exists as a product or whatever, or somebody executed that idea, that could even be a confirmation that this idea is a good idea because it's worth doing, right? But um, that brings me into the uh, into the next problem then. Uh, the problem then of thinking, okay, if I pursue this idea, if I execute this idea, will it be good enough for anybody to yeah. consume? And this is kind of a very basic question. I think that anybody who does any form of art needs to face 
the artist needs to face this question of, yeah. I do this, and if I like it, what I, what I did, is this good enough for anybody else to like also, right? And is this something worthwhile and worth publishing or, or admiring? Which is, which is a very hard question. But I guess as long as we uh, follow our own spark of, um, of interest and we create things that we like and we iterate and we create more things that we like, we will eventually get better at it. And even if right now it's not worthwhile for other people to, to consume, I think it will get over time. I mean, it, you know, it's the same like with, with, with a podcast where, where yeah. you, know, you start out and, and nobody is listening to it. But, you know, now that we kept going at it, I don't know, today I read some YouTube comments of people writing that they, that they really appreciated the, the episode and, you know, and they, they start to give their own input uh, into it then. And, and I think that's, that's kind of astonishing because, you know, it, it confirms this thinking that if you keep going at it and you keep getting better at, at the thing, eventually it will be good enough for, for other people to consume. Yeah, I think I think there's this really interesting uh, question of, of like, well, what's what's the motivation, and how does your intention or your motivation for doing something affect the outcome? And a, as you're referencing, like the podcast, for example, like, uh, and I, I tell myself this, and I think it's probably you know mostly true. My intention with the podcast originally was just like we have enjoyable conversations and what the heck let's record it and put it out there and you know if we get people to listen to it great and and if not we we still enjoyed the process and i think that 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 approach is really what we want to try to bring to everything else that we do that we enjoy the process that we want to create this and we almost don't care how successful it is on the other end and i think inevitably that end leads to to more success on the other end when you're not so focused on on the outcome when you're more focused on like hey this was just enjoyable to do you know so maybe finding that finding the things that are just enjoyable to invest your time in regardless of the outcome regardless of what you produce right like i mean in a sense that's you know what comes to mind is the the Tao Te Ching right like not being attached to the the fruits of your labor you know um so i guess i guess that's where i'm i'm kind of at with it and the podcast is just really enjoyable. Yeah. You know, it's great that people listen to it and, and they're getting something out of it. That's great. Yeah, it's, it's very paradoxical that, you know, now we talk about what is it that we could do that, you know, also would yield some results. And the answer is do the thing where you gain something from it, even, you know, if, if there's no profit, right? I mean, for like f find your favorite hobby that you would do um, just for yourself, right? That you would do to, um, that you gain something from it just just by doing it, and if you do that, you know enough times, then you know even other people will benefit from it, and you will gain some success from it. So as always, it, it's very paradoxical, but I agree with you. Let's just keep finding these things which are just fun and enjoyable, and um, yeah, let, let's let's. Um, if if we find uh, one of those things, let's let's just keep spinning the ideas and let's uh, also find the things that we are willing to fail for. I guess this is the the next step, and also go a bit yeah. in, into failure. You know, like with the with the course, for example. Yeah, yeah, I I think that is an important exploration. So let's let's do a little mental exercise here. What would failure with the podcast, for example, even look like? Is there going to be some point where like, ah, oh, well, we, we tried it, you know, because we never started it necessarily with the, the thought of getting anything out of doing it. I don't know if I could even identify what failure would look like. Could you? I mean, what, what would failure with the podcast look like? Um, if we have to talk about stuff that I'm not interested in. So, or... Or if we yeah. run out of things yeah. to speak about that we're interested in, but we kind of have to still do it because there there is a followership or, or something like this, and then it becomes this dreadful thing. You know, it, it's like a meeting that you don't want to be in, but you kind of have to, which sometimes okay. happens. Meetings that could have been emails or, um, you know, just topics they're not interested in, but you, you have this task, so you now need to sit in this meeting and, and finish it. Uh, you know, if it becomes this, this would be uh, really shitty, and I think this would be the point where I'd say, okay, let's, 
uh, let's quit or let's pause for a longer time. But so far it hasn't, and um, it serves the purpose of, I mean, it, it, it has actually become this thing that serves multiple purposes. So we have this space where we get to reflect things. We, um, we have built a, a very broad basis on, on top of which we can build and reflect things, right? I mean, we can take any topic right now, and we already have all of this basis that we built on these, I don't know, 30 plus hours that we talked about uh, spirituality, technology, all of these topics that interest, and, and it's become this platform for reflecting. And that in itself is valuable, right? Because whenever I leave the podcast, I yeah. feel like uh, I've, I've reflected on the topic that we talked about. Um, and, and I have the feeling that uh, we're speaking at the level where, where it's interesting and engaging and we're not repeating and regurgitating things that we already knew, right? So, for example, this topic today, procrastination. Right. I don't know, you know what I'm going to say next. I'm reflecting live together with you, and this brings value to me. And uh, if this yeah. brings also value to other people, if they're able to follow this conversation and reflect for themselves, perhaps, then you know, even better. So that that's, that's amazing, but that's just bonus. You know, right. we still have yeah. some value from this. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So much good, good stuff in here. I'm, I'm feeling a little bit motivated to, you know, maybe pursue more of my own side projects that have been backburnered for so long and yeah, but, but how to keep that going and, and what, uh, what kind of gets in the way or what, you know, what causes us to, to stop in spite of, you know, having initial motivation and, and good intentions. I think one of the things that you mentioned feeling that you're, you know, somebody else is already doing it or maybe did it so much better, you know, is, is, um, can be demotivating. And, and one thing I actually, uh, I was going to bring up in, in regard to that, I, I feel that this, this book start with why actually kind of address that point very well was that, um, and there are so many examples of companies that have been very successful, not being the first to market, not being the first to, you know, do, do whatever their special niche was, but because they had a clearer sense of why they ended up doing it so much better and being so much more successful, even though they weren't the first ones there. And there were two, uh, two really great examples of this one one being like the iPod, it was not the first MP3 player, you know, to, to market, but it was, you know, massively successful relative to the other ones that were out there. I think the main one uh, that came out first was from, I think that company creative, they make speakers or something also, I believe. Um, and, uh, the, the creative product was actually maybe even better, at least in terms of storage space and a number of other, other, uh, factors as far as I understand, but. Apple had their very clear why, right? And, and think different, right? I think it's kind of their, their approach and it, it resonates with people, right? And I, that's a really valuable takeaway that I got from that book is that when your why resonates with people, it's almost like all of the rest of it is kind of just an afterthought. And the other example they gave of, of a company that really wasn't first to market in, in their kind of space was, was Southwest an airline in the United States. That's, uh, been pretty successful, right? And and they really uh, they're seen as having a lot of integrity in terms of the way that they operate because they really do embody their their why, which is kind of like you know uh, cheap flights taking care of their customers and stuff, and also taking care of their employees, right? You know, and I th I think that that's another paradigm that uh, tends to be very useful is putting your employees first. You know, which very few companies really, really do. I, I think that if I were to start a company and had many employees myself, that that would be a value I would want to really embody. Yeah, the the why is super important. So for company culture, but like also if we think about these projects that we uh, want to accomplish, the why will be always important to to keep in mind because inevitably there will be stretches of also you know boring work i mean let's be honest any yeah. project 
I mean, I don't think that you will have always projects where you like to do 100% of the things, right? So in sure. order to keep pushing through the uh, 20, 40% of boring work that needs to be done for, for a project to be accomplished, it fucking helps if you know your why. Because that's a goal you can keep in yeah. mind and you can remind yourself always, it's like, okay, the greater purpose of, of, of this project is X, Y, Z, you know, and it's going to motivate you also through the, the phases which, uh, which might be difficult or, or failure, right? I mean, if you don't have a why and you fail, I think this is the end to, to, to any project, which is why, uh, yeah. it's super important to have values and, and know your why, especially as a, as a company, but I also don't know that many companies with great company culture. Most of the time, it is somewhat, you know, fake. This thing which yep. where they try to glue people somehow together, but uh, people usually feel if it's if it's fake or not. But if a company really follows a a great purpose, you know, um, that's something rare. But that's that's uh, amazing. Um, and it's and you 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 also see it. I think that people who know their why are much more motivated and also much more productive in the end of the way. You know, knowing your why brings free productivity, basically. So mm -hmm. I I don't know. I think that company leaders should be uh, more focused uh, on that. But I think it is also that people are becoming aware of it. I don't know, like. Thought leaders like Simon Sinek, uh, who speaks a lot about like purpose, why, and is influencing company culture largely. I think there's also a shift happening in, in general that also with the next generation, with Gen Z, that is much more demanding than, than we were. Like in our generation, let's be honest, we also kind of accepted uh, bad company culture. You know, it was like, we're not really demanding, yeah. like as long as um, we were paid well we're also willing to accept shitty company culture but i think next generation is much more demanding and you know they they are pointing things out they're changing things they're not accepting whatever we inherited to them so i think it will inevitably change and beyond that i, I think that we're also for for what we talked about for you know creating projects doing our own projects realizing side projects and so on we got to say that we have it is a really good time for that because also the things that we are interested in, for example, the intersection of spirituality, technology, psychology, health, mental health, you know, somatic work, all of these things, they're at the rise. I have the feeling that there is a large yeah. audience. The audience is growing. It is these things are topics in mainstream podcasts. Um, you know, the big influencers are interested yeah. in in these things. So I feel comfortable uh, in, in that sense that it is cool that we're interested in these things right now where there's also a global interest and where there's more and more light shined on psychology, mental health, you know, as a general population, we're learning these things. Therefore, I think that we will find our role in, you know, spreading the knowledge about these things. I don't know what a role will be in it, but I think, you know, there, there's a role to be filled here. And um, it's at least a, a great timing. Like, imagine if we were interested in all of the stuff we talk in the podcast in the eighties. I don't think we would sure. have many listeners. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, and and there would be sort of a, a dearth or a, a lack of of resources and access to the resources. Right. I mean, like we're at such a great time in in terms of you know, uh, individual empowerment and especially with, with things like AI, just the uh, uh, ability of an individual person to understand things and accomplish things is just, you know, massively increasing, you know, so that's, that's really exciting. And, you know, one, uh, not, not to go on too much of another tangent or anything, but I'll throw it out there anyways, you know, I think one of the ways that I've been uh, honing in on, on really finding my own personal why is looking at the way that I suffer in my own life and trying to address those things, right? Like social anxiety. That's something that I've put a lot of work into on, on my own personal level and seen uh, enough you know, positive results that I've reached a point of feeling good about being able to share it with other people. 
right? And and that's definitely something that I'm like very interested in and and can ideally, you know, uh, overcome my procrastination around. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm uh, I very much like the archetype of the wounded healer. Um, where where mm-hmm. the idea is that um, the person that has been hurt that has a specific wound, um, regardless of whether it healed this wound or not, will be the best person to heal this wound within uh, other people. So I, I like this metaphor so, so much in, in the in the context of I don't know psychotherapy and mental health in general because I think that if if you have a problem you will resonate naturally the most with the person in the room who also had this problem and who has resolved it. A person who had yeah. a problem and resolved it uh, naturally carries um, the this, this solution and, and it just shows, right? And yeah, uh, I think that is a, a great benefit because if, if, you are, if you really uh, overcame a difficult situation in your life or a problem in your life and you really integrated that and now you live that i think the best thing that you can do is share it because you can shorten mm. other people's suffering with that because you overcame the thing without much help most likely and now you you will be there to help people and to, uh, to make it shorter for them you'll be the person who i've been in your yeah. situation and this will resonate with the people and um, it will be so much easier for those people, right? So you're helping up uh, those people and, and this image is, is something that is motivating me uh, so much and this is why exactly uh, I'm also thrilled about the course because this is exactly one of those things where we feel we've integrated this, we've overcome this, you know, what what would be better than than sharing that? And and also yeah. one, one fallacy there is that uh, and one thing that, that is sometimes also blocking me to to act on these ideas is this idea that you have to be 100% healed in, in order to true. help other people. But I think this this in fact is uh, is not true. And I don't think that there is uh, that let's say all the psychotherapists out there need to be 100% problem free and uh, you know without complexes. I think this doesn't exist. I think we're uh, all humans, and we will never 100% heal all of our wounds. But nevertheless, you know, you've even if you've come 80%, you're still able to help other people with that 80% much better than somebody who does not have the uh, the same wound. But it's, it's also a thing where, you know, it it could have been one reason for procrastination, where you say, oh, I still have this problem sometimes. So how could I be? sharing about this problem to other people, but I think that you still can. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I, I think that, you know, someone who's still in it to some degree will tend to connect with people better than someone that feels that they've totally overcome it because then it's almost like, you know, this hierarchy of, of kind of putting the, the teacher on a pedestal. But if the teacher is just another student, Right, and you can relate to them, like on on, on a personal level. Then I I think that uh, is, is really powerful, right? I, and I think that we maybe don't um, don't give enough credit to that. We kind of uh, to to some degree we know it, but we also, you know, we don't permit ourselves that in a sense. Like we hold ourselves to almost a, an impossible standard of like, oh, well, I can never teach this until I've totally mastered it, even though the best teachers that you ever had were students, you know, still students themselves, right? It's it's kind of that beginner's mindset and being a perpetual student in a sense. Yeah. I guess we forget that all the all the great teachers out there, they, they started somewhere and probably their first pieces, their first courses, their first lessons did not look great uh, either. Yet, when we look at our own first uh, steps, you know, it's, it's always difficult. Especially, it's also difficult to go out with with that. Uh, but yeah, that's also the the best way to learn to go out with your ideas, to pr- also present them, to get feedback on them, to fall on your nose with them, yeah. and and then to be uh, then to become better. So yeah, I think that's the road ahead. Sounds good. I think that's a good place to end it. All right. 